author of the series of books, Mitchell's Magical Days. I've got a few of them here. Um, you may recognize these from your um, classroom or your school media center. There are copies of each of these in the uh, media centers of all of our elementary schools here in Broward County. And the premise of the books is a little boy uh, borrows his pop-ups or his grandfather pop-ups magical binoculars and he has adventures with those. And so we're going to uh, read one of Mitchell's books today. And the one I've selected for today is Mitchell's Magical Day on the New River. Have you ever been to the New River? Well, it's a very special place here in Broward County in Fort Lauderdale, and we're going to learn a bit more about it. First, I want to show you this picture. Does this look familiar to you? Have any of you been to the Stranahan House? The Stranahan House is the oldest building in Broward County. It was built in 1901. It's not the first building to be built, but it's the oldest because the others have been torn down to make way for newer buildings. That was the home for of our first school teacher, Ivy Cromarty Stranahan. And maybe you've read Mitchell's Magical Day with Frank and Ivy Stranahan. Um, so we're going to learn more about the New River today. And we're going to start with um, Mitchell in his yard and Mitchell's mother's inside the house. Mitchell, Mitchell. Mitchell's mother called from the kitchen window on the west side of the yellow house. Her voice floated through the warm evening air and drifted into the backyard where Mitch and Billy were patching a bicycle inner tube. Have you ever had to do that? Get a or get a flat tire on your bicycle. Mitch's red bike was upside down in the grass. The rear wheel was on the porch step. Mitchell, she repeated. Billy held the dusty black inner tube while Mitch pressed down on the glued patch. We have to hurry, Mitch sighed. I hope this holds. Grab the pump. Billy darted into the carport and came back with a green metal foot, foot pump that he attached to the valve stem of the inner tube. As Mitch held out the tube, Billy pumped with his right foot tube slowly began to expand and then a small hissing sound. Here's a picture of Mitch and Billy trying to patch that inner tube and get that bicycle back together again. The patch isn't holding, Mitch exclaimed. Billy stopped pumping and wiped his forehead with the back of his arm. Or maybe there's another hole we missed. Let's try again. Billy and Mitchell often rode their bikes down to the New River and sat on the seawall next to the New River Inn. With their fishing rods in hand and some ballyhoo in a bucket, they usually caught their share of red snapper. But it was the jacks that put up the best fight, often taking the bait and tackle right off the line. Once Billy was sure he had hooked a barracuda, but his father was certain there wouldn't be any barracuda that far up the river. Now that summer vacation had started, school was fading into their memories and fishing was on their minds every day, fishing and bicycles. Try another patch, Billy said as Mitchell examined the flattened tube. Mitchell, his mother called again. Without a bike, there would be no more fishing. Actually, getting to the river was half the fun. The trip from Mitchell's house on the corner of 14th and 8th took about 20 minutes. Down Davy Boulevard, north over the 7th Avenue Bridge, a quick right turn along the marina. The bridge was had always caught their attention. Looking up at the towering sailboat mass in the marina made them feel dizzy. Smells of varnish and paint and fiberglass filled the salty air. One day, Mitchell thought, I'll have a boat of my own. Mitch and Billy often talked about building a boat to fish on the New River, or a raft, like Huckleberry Finns. Now that would lead to adventure. Mitchell Allen Andrews! Oh, 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 she means business, Mitch exclaimed to Billy. You'd better go. Come over tomorrow after breakfast. Mitch dropped the inner tube and ran into the kitchen through the side door by the carport. The screen door slammed behind him. Didn't you hear me calling you, Mitchell? Dinner's nearly ready. Go wash up and get that grease off your hands, his mother scolded as she brought a carton of milk from the refrigerator. Oh, let me have some of that, please, Anna. Half a cup. These potatoes are too thick. Mitchell's Aunt Helen was standing at the counter holding an electric mixer in a large metal bowl. The beaters of the mixer hit the side of the bowl as his mother slowly poured in the mi milk. That's enough, dear. Yes, that will do fine, Aunt Helen said gently. She continued mixing and turned to Mitch just like I make at home. Good old Pennsylvania cooking. You do like my turnip mashed potatoes, don't you? She smiled, her soft silver hair shone in the late afternoon sun that filtered through the large kitchen window. Aunt Helen was Mitch's mother's older sister. Although they looked nothing alike, Helen had very fair skin and was about as tall as Mitch. His mother was taller with dark brown hair and dark eyes. I'll make you a deal. I'll share a little of my home cooking with you and later you can share things with me. 
like that red snapper you caught the other day. Her blue eyes twinkled. Aunt Helen usually came to Fort Lauderdale in February when she wanted to escape the cold northern winters. But this year she had decided to come in July and for a very good reason. Mitch's birthday was only a day away. Maybe you'll take me fishing while I'm here, Helen continued. I've never been fishing, did you know that? Your Uncle Dick tried to get me to fish, but I never did. Maybe it was those wiggly worms that put me off. Do you use wiggly worms to catch your supper, Mitchell? Worms to catch snapper? Well, I've heard it all. There was a jolly laugh as Pop-Pop entered the kitchen. He patted Mitch on the shoulder. You'd better take her next time you go. Let's give her a try. My girls never took to fishing. Now, Father, Mitch's mother chimed in, you leave Helen and me out of your fishing expeditions. We'll cook the fish, we'll clean the fish, but we don't want to catch the fish. That's your job. She gently poked Pop up in the belly with her finger. Now then, Mitch, I thought you were going to go wash up. Sure, Pop up replied. He ducked beneath Pop up and went down the narrow hall, trying to keep his greasy hands off the walls. Pop up followed. Well, Mitch, are you going down to the New River tomorrow? I'll set you up with some new tackle. I've been working on it. Pop up loved to fish. At least twice a month, he took Mitch to Anglin's Pier in the early mornings, and they never went home empty handed. Do you know where Anglin's Pier is? It's in Lauderdale by the Sea or Commercial Boulevard ends right at the Atlantic Ocean. You can go. I can't go, Mitch replied, my tire's flat. He, he lathered his hands up in the sink. The patch didn't hold. He dries his hand against his pant leg instead of a towel. Maybe it's just as well, Pop-Pop said. Why is that, Mitch asked. Just a hunch, Pop-Pop replied with a wink. Mitch awoke the next morning to see sun peeking through the palm trees in his bedroom window. It was July 8th his birthday. He was 10 years old. On his ninth birthday, his mother made a three-layer chocolate cake and, and invited all his friends over for a barbecue. And of course, Pop-Pop took him to Anglin's Pier. But this year, for some reason, Pop-Pop said he couldn't take him. So Mitch planned to go fishing on the river with Billy. Mitch went through the kitchen door into the cool morning. The wet dew tickled his bare feet. On the arm of a lawn chair, he found the old flat inner tube right where he had left it the night before. He scratched at the rubber patch with his fingernail. Stupid thing, he sighed. Just then, Billy arrived on his bike. Mitch, hey, Mitch, happy birthday, Billy cheered as he waved a piece of white paper. Here, it was a handmade birthday card. On the front was a drawing of two boys fishing from a small boat. Happy birthday was written inside. Each letter was a different color. Thanks, Mitch exclaimed. And look, Billy exclaimed, look what I found. He held up a bicycle inner tube still new in its box. It was in the garage. I forgot it was there, Billy said. Great, Mitch shouted with excitement. The two boys dashed over to the tire and scrambled to put the bicycle back together again. It's still early enough. The air is cool. If we hurry, the fish will still be biting. Mitch ran to the carport to get a wrench. Mitchell, dear, would you come here for a minute? Aunt Helen called out from the porch. I'd like to see you. Oh, good morning, Billy, she waved. Good morning, Mrs. Rankin, Billy looked up briefly and smiled and then went right back to work. How's our birthday boy this morning? Our happy birthday boy. My, 10 years old already. It seems yesterday I was changing your, oh, Aunt Helen, Mitch sighed. Why do grownups always have to mention changing diapers? After all, in a few years, he'd probably have his own boat and he'd be sailing to Bimini, catching prize winning sailfish. I'm only 10 years old. In 20, in another 10 years, I'll be 20 years old. And then I can have my own fishing boat, he said proudly. Well, Aunt Helen continued, I know that you and Billy very much want to go fishing this morning, but I have another idea. I thought it would be nice if we took a trip on a boat today, a ride on the water taxi. Your mother called last night to make all the arrangements. You know, where I grew up in Westchester, Pennsylvania, history is very important. We try to preserve and protect our old buildings and historic properties. So while I'm here, I'd like to learn more about your special New River. And it's, his, and it's history since you spent so much time there. Do you know much about the history of the New River, Mitch? Mitch took a moment to answer. Hmm. Well, he slowly replied, looking down at the green grass beneath his bare feet. Our teacher, Mrs. Jennings, taught us some things like, hmm, he scratched the side of his head above his ear. Well, I know the Seminoles lived on the river a long time ago, and I think there was a trading post here Frank Stranahan's trading post. Yes, I remember the Seminoles came there to trade alligator skins and stuff. 
Mitch grew more excited as he talked. And, and there are manatees in that river and big, big tarpon. Billy and I see them this big. He stretched out his arms. Seminoles and manatees and very large fish, Aunt Helen laughed. Won't that be exciting? After our ride, we'll ask the captain to take us to a nice waterfront restaurant for lunch. Would you like that? Mitch's face lit up with a grin that spanned from ear to ear. <laughs> the tops of his cheeks grew red with excitement. Wow, would I ever, he shouted. Sure thing. When? When do we go? He ran over to Billy. Hey, Billy, did you hear that? Aunt Helen is taking me on the water taxi for my birthday. Did, did you hear? Wow. Yeah, yeah, I heard. I heard. That, that's, that's, that's really great. I mean, it really is. Billy smiled faintly at Mitch. Well, have fun. Lots of fun. He picked up his bike. I guess I better be going. Where are you running off to, Aunt Helen asked. Aren't you coming with us? We're counting on you to be part of Mitch's birthday. She gave Billy a soft pat on his shoulder. He smiled a big smile. Well, run along and ask your mother if you can join us. I'm sure she'll say yes. Plan to be back here in an hour. Billy kept smiling as he pedaled down the street as fast as he could. After all, what is a birthday without friends? Aunt Helen laughed and gave Mitch a big hug. I want to go back here to a picture I want to show you. They made reference, I made reference in the book to the New River Inn. This is our New River Inn. It sits along the New River. It's now the home of the Fort Lauderdale History Center. And it was one of our first hotels here in Fort Lauderdale. It was built right next to the train tracks. And when people would come by train, they could stay at our New River Inn. It was built in 1905. Let's get back to our story. A strong breeze blew across the docks at Lauderdale Marina. Do you know where Lauderdale Marina is? At the end of 15th Street. If you attend Harbordale Elementary, that you know where Lauderdale Marina is. It's on the street that your school is on. The tide was low and the air was heavy with the smells of salt and fish. Mitch and Billy looked down into the swirling water, hoping to sp uh, spot a school of Jack or huge tarpon. My, isn't this a treat, Helen said as she adjusted her wide straw hat. We don't have anything like this in Pennsylvania. A graceful brown pelican glided in front of the dock and roosted on top of a piling. Two more pelicans dove into the water, hoping to find a late breakfast. And here we have a picture of the intercoastal waterway. And in the background is the uh, 17th Street Bridge. And this is uh, in the area not too far away from Port Everglades, in case you know where that is. That's one of our big ports here in Florida. Mitch's mother and Pop-Pop sat on a wooden bench at the water's edge, watching colorful boats pass by. Yes, this is certainly a treat, she said. And she turned toward Mitchell, who was dangling from a piling over the water a foot away from the dock. Mitchell, she exclaimed. Mitch swung around and looked over his shoulder at her. Did you see something? Did you see a shark or something? He panted excitedly. No, no, none of that, but I see a young man who's about to fall into the water, and I'm not jumping in to save him. Let's hope there's not a shark down there. Ah, here she comes, Pop-Up stated as he pointed north. That's our girl. Pop-Up always referred to boats as girls. He would say, oh, she's a lovely old girl, whenever an old wooden boat passed by their favorite fishing spot. Yes, she's here, he continued as he walked along the dock. A large, yellow, open boat with a green canopy made its way along the canal. The captain stood at the wheel and guided her nose first up against the seawall. Welcome aboard, he called and reached to give Aunt Helen a hand. My name is Captain Carl. How is everyone this fine day? As Aunt Helen was seated, Captain Carl helped Mitch's mother aboard. Billy and Mitch were boarded next and then Pop-Up who clamored on like an old salty sailor. Where would you folks like to go? Captain Carl asked. Anything special you'd like to see? It's my grandson Mitch's birthday, Pop-Up replied as he smiled at Mitch. He and his friend Billy always go down to the New River to fish, so we thought they might like to see the river from a boat for a change. And I hope they learn something about the history of the river too, Aunt Helen added. Well, happy birthday, Mitchell, Captain Carl exclaimed as he swung the large ship's wheels to the left and pushed the throttle forward. The boat rumbled and plowed to the small white caps and waves. So you boys like to fish on this river? The New River is very special special indeed. It's where the whole city began. We wouldn't have Fort Lauderdale if it wasn't for this river. He swung the boat around and pointed the bow north. A strong breeze blew through the open vessel. And here we have a picture of some boats on the New River. Uh, and this is where the entire gang is headed in the water taxi. 
We're in the intercoastal waterway now, the captain continued. This section of waterway was the East Coast Canal, a private barge tollway from the late 1800s up until the 1920s. Then the U.S. government got the deed to it. Since that time, the Army Corps of Engineers has had the job of overseeing and maintaining it. The total length of the intercoastal waterway extends from Key West to Maryland, he continued. Now look there off to the west. This is where the new river comes in. We're going to head that way. This is a picture of the uh, new river and the intercoastal waterway where they meet. And far in the distance is where the new river comes out to meet the um, the intercoastal waterway. And actually there's a very shallow area there where people swim. Isn't this exciting, Anne Helen chirped in? My, look at all these lovely homes, each one with water for a backyard. This area was all mangrove swamp, Captain, uh, Captain Carl said, as he mentioned to the Northeast, motion to the Northeast. In the 1920s, long narrow canals were dredged out and the fill was used to make peninsulas between the canals, the same way it was done in Venice, Italy. That's why we call Fort Lauderdale the Venice of America. Do you know what a peninsula is? What's the difference between a peninsula and an island? You know, don't you? An island is surrounded by water on all sides, but a peninsula is surrounded on three sides. The state of Florida is a peninsula. If you look at its shape, you can see that it's surrounded by water except for one uh, edge. And that's the way these uh, canals were dug in Fort Lauderdale to have long, peninsulas, almost like fingers sticking out into the water, and uh, later houses would be built on those small peninsulas. Although all this area was mangrove swamp and it was underwater, people really didn't want to live here. During his travels, Ponce de Leon himself may have named this river Rio Saleda, Salty River. It shows up on his charts from a voyage in 1513. Can you imagine? Other Spanish explorers charted this river back in the 1600s. It shows up on their charts as Rio Novo, or New River. The mouth of the river cut through to the ocean where Bahia Mar Marina stands today. But the river was fickle. The mouth would move. At times, the river would run out where the inlet is today, at Port Everglades. At other times, the mouth of the river might be further south, near Sheridan Street in Hollywood. That's likely how the river earned its name. Each time an explorer came to the area, it seemed as though the river had moved and a new river had taken its place. Captain Carl piloted his boat between the red and green channel markers. It's a very deep river, over 100 feet in some places, and only nine miles long. But no one's sure exactly how the new river got its name. As the water taxi skimmed along, a gentle breeze blew over the deck. Billy climbed toward the bow and looked over the side, and Helen sat with Mitch's mother at the stern, the back of the boat. Both of them have taken off their hats, and the wind gently tugged at their hair. Hey, pop up. Hey, Mitchell. Hey, Mitchell, I brought something for you. He reached into his tan canvas bag and pulled out a scuffed leather case with a narrow strap. Slowly, he unfastened the buckle and lifted out a pair of binoculars. So he had a little leather case, and inside the leather case, he had a pair of binoculars. Mitchell, I brought these for you. Carefully, he unfastened the buckle and lifted out the worn binoculars. Do you remember these? I had these when I was your age, kept them all this time. He placed the binoculars and the leather case into Mitchell's lap. They'll let you see things that other people can't see. The leather case was dried and cracked and old. Dull brass through, through, shone through the worn paint on the binoculars. Mitchell held them to his eyes. Look carefully, Mitch Popup exclaimed. Concentrate. You might be surprised by what you see. I can see things much clearer now, Popup, he uh, explained but it all looks the same, just closer up. I don't see anything special. Well, you just keep looking. When the time is right, you'll know what I mean. Pop-Up replied to Mitchell as he patted him on the shoulder. I'm gonna sit with my girls. Let me know if you see anything unusual through those binoculars. With a wink of his eye, he worked, walked to the back of the boat and sat next to Aunt Helen. Unusual, Mitch thought to himself. What will I see that's so unusual through these? He placed the binocular strap around his neck and the binoculars hung 
from around his neck and Captain Carl turned the boat to head west down the New River. The tide's running against us, Captain Carl said as he gave the engines a little more gas. Twice a day, the river empties itself out and starts anew. His voice was hard to hear above the roaring engine. Captain Carl, Mitch asked as he got up and stood near the helm, do you think people always fished here on the New River like Billy and I do? Well, I imagine so. We know that Tequesta Indians lived in this area about a thousand years or so, give or take a few years. In fact, on the New River by the 7th Avenue Bridge, there was a midden. A midden. The words caught Billy's attention and he joined Mitch by the captain. A midden? What's that? Mitch asked. Well, it's like a, a trash heap, I guess, Captain Carl continued. A place where the Tequestas put their garbage, their trash. When that marina was being built on the east side, all kinds of things were being found, mostly shark vertebrae. You see, the Tequesta were hunters and gatherers. They lived off sharks and crabs and crayfish in the water and deer and birds from the land. They gathered plant food and kunti along the river. Kunti, Billy asked with a tilt of his head. <laughs> What's kunti? Kunti is a plant with a large bulbous root, kind of like a potato. Some kuti plants grow as large as footballs. It was an important crop here on the river for many years. Sailors' biscuits were made from kuti flour. Captain Carl continued talking as Aunt Helen made her way to the helm, and she listened carefully. Captain, what happened to the Tequestas? Did they live with the settlers here along the river? Captain Carl let up the throttle and the engines quieted down. The water taxi slowly pushed through the ripples. He turned and pointed to the east. It was probably the Tequesta that met the Spanish ships here in the 1500s, he explained. When explorers came from Spain and England and France, they brought with them diseases and germs that were deadly to the Tequesta. The Tequesta had no natural immunity to smallpox or the flu or even the cold. It may have been chickenpox that killed many of them. Imagine chickenpox that killed the Tequesta Indians. Within a hundred years after the explorers set foot here, the population of the Tequesta dropped by nearly 90%. That means for every 100 Tequestas that live here, 90 of them didn't survive. Captain Carl took his head, shook his head in dismay and nudged the throttle. The water taxi began to pick up speed. Just imagine how this area looked when Tequestas lived here, Captain Carl continued. This was all wilderness. Scrub palms, mangroves, black bear, cougars, and skies filled with birds. He motioned with a sweep of his arm. Yep, wilderness as far as the eye can see. And if you look at the picture behind me, it'll give you an idea of what this area looked like before we developed it into a city. From the Everglades to the oceans, with the New River winding through it, Billy and Mitch looked into Captain Carl's blue-green eyes and then looked into the waterway, trying to envision his words. A loud rumble inter Mitch interrupted Mitch's thought as a wide, three-tiered tour boat filled with lively and noisy passengers motored by. The people all waved, and Mitch and Billy waved back. Captain, could we stop up ahead? Aunt Helen said as she pointed to the north bank, up there where there are some stores along the river. I'd like to find some special treasures to take back to Pennsylvania. I did promise to bring a little something back for everyone. Do you mind, Anna? She turned to Mitch's mother, who had spotted the storks herself. No, not at all. Let's stop and take a look. I want to pause here for just a minute and go back to the Tequesta Indians. Some of us refer to uh, the name Tequesta as Tequesta, but that's an incorrect pronunciation. We want to say Tequesta. They were Native American people that were named by the Spanish and the uh, sound that is made by the QE is a K sound, not a, it's Tequesta. So always think of that when you see the word. Uh, they were here before the Seminoles, quite a long time before the Seminoles arrived in this area. Captain Carl brought the water taxi up to the dock and helped the ladies ashore. Mitch and Billy climbed off and Pop-Pop followed. How about I come back for you all in about an hour? Would that be okay? Captain Carl asked as the ladies wanted to shop. Sure, that's perfect, Aunt Helen replied. We'll meet you here at this dock in one hour. See you then. She waved goodbye with her left hand and clutched her purse with her right. It wasn't long before a sunglass stand caught her attention. They're going to be a while, Pop Pop laughed, as the ladies tried on all sorts of funny and colorful sunglasses. Why don't you boys take a look around? But 
don't go far and be very careful near the water's edge. He rubbed his gray mustache. And Mitch, he continued, don't forget to try these binoculars. This is a great spot for unusual things to happen. Mitch and Billy wandered along the paved walkway past the storefronts and restaurants to the water's edge where a large sailboat was docked. Hey, Billy, Mitch thought aloud, can you imagine? This is wilderness, I mean true wilderness with bears and panthers and stuff. And Seminoles, Billy added quickly. The river ran from the Everglades to the ocean, Mitch continued as he held the binoculars up to his eyes. Remember Pop-Up said, look carefully, you might see things that no one else can see. There in the distance through the trees, he could see more of the city of Fort Lauderdale, the Performing Arts Center. His class had seen a play there, maybe you have too. The Museum of Discovery and Science. The New River came into focus and there was the New River Inn with its wide porches on the first and second floors. There were boatyards and a restaurant across the river. Billy, you wanna take a look at these binoculars? But Billy didn't answer. A fully rigged fishing boat had captured his attention down at the dock. Mitch continued to scan the north shore of the river through the binoculars. He saw buildings and stores and seawalls, but slowly things began to change. His vision blurred. What the? He grabbed the binoculars, rubbed his eyes, and had another look. What's going on, he wondered. The buildings disappeared. So did the large tour boats. In their places stood tall trees and palmetto shrubs and bushy cypress stretched their long gnarled roots into the clear water. The air was hot and still. On the river, a wooden sloop approached. At his helm stood a thin man with a long beard and a well-worn hat. You there, lad, lend me a hand. The man threw a coil of line to Mitch. Make her fast, will you? Tie her up well, he said as he climbed onto the muddy shore. His clothes fit loosely and appeared to be sewn by hand. His skin was burned by the sun. What's the name there, lad? Who are your people? I don't see many your age around here. Surely you're not out here alone. Uh, no, no, Mitch stammered. I I'm not alone. I'm here with my family. They're, they're over, they're over by the, Mitch stopped in mid-sentence. The shops were gone. A dense growth of palms sat in their place. Are your folks nearby? The man continued as he tied his boat to a cypress root. I need a few men to help me. Is your pa around? I'd ask you, but I'm afraid you're a mite young for this job, but your pa would do. I'd pay him a fair wage for his work. Can you find him? My, uh, my, my pa? Well, my, my pop-up, he's, uh, he's, uh, well, maybe pop-up can. I say, yes, your pop will do. You see, son, I need able men to help me salvage today. And fast we must be, no time to waste. Up to Hillsboro, 15 miles north of here, the gill blasts a ground. The September storm pushed her up. Worst storm in years. Now the tide's holding her till we get out to her. A fine 200 ton Spanish brig full of cigars and sugar and board lumber. I've been contracted to salvage her cargo, but I, I can't go alone. Can your pop pop join us? Your pop and other men. Wade Rigby, El Edward Beasley, Davy Williams. Do you know of them? We're off to Hillsborough to see if we can float the gill blast. What do you have to say then, lad? Go ask your pop to come along. Mitch stumbled over his words. Finally, in a weak voice, he asked, Who are you? What, what year is it? What year? Ah, <laughs> indeed. Been traveling a long spell, have you? Time gets lost, it does. Days run one into the other. I just turned the new, it just turned the new year, son. 1836. But here, seasons don't know one from another. That's what brought me here, this fine weather. Came in 1824, me and my family. We're just up the river where I have a Kunti plantation. Kunti, I've heard of that, Mitch exclaimed, remembering Captain Carl's explanation. Sure, Kunti grows easy around these parts. Looks like a spiky fern. Why there's so much of it, the Seminoles call this river Kunti Hatchi. You take the root and grind it and mash it like a potato, but you can't eat it raw out of the ground, no sir. That'll make you mighty sick, could even kill you. See, the root has to be ground and dried and rinsed over and over. Then it's safe for eating. I sell mine as starch for bread making. I can get more than 10 cents a pound for it. He paused. Oh, sorry, son, I forgot my manners. He extended a leathery hand toward Mitch. Cooley's the name, Will Cooley. Farmer, wilderness guide, wrecker, justice of the peace, among other things. He smiled. And you are? Uh, Mitch, I, I'm Mitch. 
well, really, Mitchell, uh, Mitchell Allen Andrews. Mitch shook Mr. Cooley's rough, weathered hand. Young Mitchell, Mr. Cooley continued, why don't you run and find your pup? And I'll tell you what, while we're away, you can visit with my children. The children's tutor is here. His name's Joseph Flinton. He'll teach you a few letters, maybe even a few words. Great idea. Your pop sails with me and the others while Joseph looks after you. You can tell your pop you'll be in safe hands. My place is just down the river along this path. I'm sure your pop will be grateful for you to get a little learning while you're here. He placed his hand firmly on Mitch's shoulder. Go then, son, fetch your pop, then make your way to the homestead and tell Mr. Flinton I sent you down. You'll be safe there until we return from the wreck site. Mr. Cooley scrambled down to the water and added a few lines to secure his wooden boat against the tides. Here we have a picture of the gill blast. Now we're not sure this is an actual drawing of the gill blast, but it gives you an idea of what a, a shipwreck might have looked like at that time and the men going to salvage what they can off of the shipwreck. If they could get the ship floated, they might be able to salvage it, but if they couldn't float it, they could disassemble it and take things off of the ship that they needed in the settlement, including even the lumber that had been used to build the ship. Mitch, Mitch over here, come on. Mitch turned around and saw Billy down by the river. Mitch, come quick, there's a tarpon down here. Mitch glanced back over his shoulder. Mr. Cooley and his boat were gone. The cypress were replaced with a concrete seawall. The shops were in front of him again. Mitch, you have to see this tarpon. I wish we had our tackle. Billy pointed excitedly down at the deep water. Hey, Mitch, are you okay? You seem a little weird. Everything all right? Mitch held the binoculars tightly in his hands. Yeah, yeah, he sighed. I'm fine. I'll be fine. Just, I just went exploring. I, I exploring a little, you know, using Pop-Up's binoculars. I, I guess I got lost. I mean, I lost track of time. He looked back down the river, hoping to see Mr. Cooley. Have you seen Pop? I need to ask him something. Pop? Who's Pop? Billy asked. Pop-up. I meant to say Pop-up. Have you seen him? Well, he was over on that bench, but he got up a while ago, probably shopping with your mom and your aunt. I wish we could get back on the boat. Has it been an hour yet? Hey, look, there's a soda machine. Billy fumbled in his pockets, looking for coins. I have some money, maybe enough for two sodas. Want one? A birthday soda. I'll be right back, Billy said as he walked across the courtyard toward the machine, but Mitch had other things on his mind. The gill blast, he thought to himself. Wow, a shipwreck. He held Pop-Up's binoculars back up to his eyes and peered down the river. Several large yachts sat gleaming in the summer sun. The Third Avenue Bridge opened to allow a towering sailboat to pass through. Mitch turned to the west. A train bridge was open, pointing high in the cloudless sky. A small boat motored by. Where was Mr. Cooley's farm, he wondered. He kept searching down the river, hoping the binoculars would do their magic again. Come on, come on, he whispered through the binoculars. The image slowly blurred, the colors melded together. Yes, Mitch explained, it's happening, it's happening again. The train bridge disappeared from view and the large boats vanished into the background of brushes, bushes and palms. There were no buildings, no automobiles, no boats or bridges, only a tangle of cypress roots at his feet. The river was quiet and peaceful. Suddenly came a voice. Careful, son, you're likely to fall in. Gators in there, you know, I've seen them, big ones, big as your boat. A young soldier came up behind Mitch and took his arm. Come away from the edge of the water. You're too close for safety. Where are your folks, son? Whose charge are you? He pulled Mitch up the riverbank, then brushed leaves from his uniform. Oh, drat, my uniform is all a mess. Too hot it is. My uniform is made of wool. Now who would choose wool to make uniforms to fight Indians in this heat? He took a leather cap from his head and slapped it against his hand. He tugged it back into place, adjusting the brim over his narrow, sunburned face. Who are you, by the way, traveling this path all by yourself? I'm Mitch, Mitch replied nervously. Mitchell Andrews. I'm here with my family visiting. I'm not really alone. My mother and my aunt and, and Pop-Up and oh, Billy, they're here. He turned and pointed toward the shopping arcade, but it was gone. Uh-oh, he muttered. Well, they're nearby, they are. He looked into the eyes of the tired soldier. I imagine so, no one as young as you would be here on his own. I'm Ellis Hughes, Company K, 3rd Artillery, U.S. Army. 
let me help you to safety. It's surely not safe to be alone around here. Were you on your way to explore the old picket? The old what? The picket, the old fort, up the river to the west. Our men poke around there, but it's too open, too exposed. We're not safe there. No, 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 really, Mitch said. I was just, I was just looking for the farm, Mr. Cooley's farm, Mitch stated nervously as he looked along the shoreline. Cooley's farm? What do you know about that now that his family has gone? What, Mitch gasped as he turned quickly. Gone? Gone where? Ah, oh, lad, you haven't heard then. Only been a few years. Let's see. It's now March 1839. It's been about three years ago that it happened. The soldier sat on a fallen tree to adjust his boot. And here we are. Since what happened, Mitch asked. The attack, son, of course, the attack. Cooley's wife, three young children, school teacher, not far from here. He pointed to the west. Seminoles attacked and killed them. Mr. Cooley wasn't a thing he could do. He got word, but it was too late. He lost his whole family. Ellis hung his head and Mitch's mind started racing. He was salvaging a wreck. What was the wreck? The Gil Blass. Was it the Gil Blass, the Spanish ship? Why, yes, son, I think it was her. Do you know of this? Word sure gets around, doesn't it? While Mr. Cooley was salvaging the Gil Blass, the Seminoles attacked his family? Indeed they did, son. Indeed they did. But why? Why would they do that? It seems to stem from a misunderstanding or maybe an, an injustice. You see, Mr. Cooley was a man of position here, a justice of the peace, sort of sheriff. Well, at the time, there were some white men traveling these parts to hunt and fish and trade. A pair of them had, run, had a run-in with the Seminole chief, Ali Bama. No one sure what happened next. There was some sort of argument, some sort of scuffle. What happened to Will Cooley's family? And here we have a picture of the Nuber uh, at the time when it was all wilderness and there was nothing around. And this is where Mitchell finds himself now kind of trapped in this uh, place that Mitchell's uh, pop-up's binoculars took him. The soldier continues. One of the men drew a gun and killed Alabama, left him stone dead. The Seminoles were pretty plenty angry. Word spread and Cooley, acting as justice of the peace, rounded up some suspects. He found two men accused of the attack and a trial was held. The Seminole believed that Cooley withheld important evidence that would have convicted the men for murder. But Cooley wasn't convinced he had the right men. He felt the evidence wasn't strong enough to convict him. Eventually, the two men were set free. The Seminoles felt very betrayed. Ellis Hughes stood up and brushed the bark and sand from his trousers. Relation between the white man and the Seminoles weren't good. After Andrew Jackson's men destroyed the settlements in North Florida in 1817, the Indians had been forced from their land. They came here to start again. I guess they trusted Cooley at first, but when he didn't defend them, they felt they had no choice but to seek revenge. So while Cooley was on his way to the shipwreck, they attacked. Ellis clapped his hands for effect. The sound jolted Mitch's body. Afterwards, Cooley didn't come back here for a long spell. He and other men sailed down to Cape Florida Lighthouse for refuge. Eventually, though, he came back to salvage some cannons from the wreck to help in the fighting. Mitch's heart was racing. Mr. Cooley had asked him to stay with Mr. Flint and the tutor while he went to salvage the Gil Blast. What if I had gone, he thought. What would have happened to me? Phew, that was close. Ellis Hughes didn't hear him. So here we are, Ellis continued, cut off from proper society here in this wilderness, under orders from President Jackson to force the lot of them out of here. We're here to capture as many Seminoles as we can so they can be sent to land out west. The Indian Removal Act, it's called. Ellis continued as he swatted a mosquito from his neck. The Seminoles came this way near the turn of 1800. There was a treaty signed in 1823 stating that the Seminoles would move out west within three years. It wasn't long before that treaty was broken. Their leader, Osceola, didn't take lightly to having people forced from his land. But General Jessup captured Osceola in 1837. I hear Osceola died in prison. Now we're here to move them west. Jackson wants the area clear of Seminoles. He wants them all moved out. We march through these swamps up to our hips in mud. I hear that over nine, there are over 9,000 of us soldiers in Florida doing the same thing, trying to capture Seminoles. Ellis turned and looked over his shoulder. His brown eyes squinted. Look over there, he whispered. Danger's not far off. 
here's a picture of what the fort may have looked like. This is just an artist's drawing of the fort. You can see it's very simple, just a log fence around a few buildings. It wasn't very secure, certainly not the way we think of uh, forts as stone fortresses. And here's a sketch. Uh, this is a very important sketch, actually. I'm going to try to move in so you can see it. This is a sketch done actually by Ellis Hughes, the, the man we're talking about in the story. He was a real man. And this is a sketch he drew in his diary while he was stationed along the New River to help uh, capture Seminole Indians under Andrew Jackson's Indian Removal Act. And those uh, Native Americans or Seminoles were to be shipped out to what is now the state of Oklahoma. Danger is not far off. Ellis pointed to curling smoke in the west. They're here. They're here, but we don't see them. We don't know where they are, but they can sense that we're standing right here on this riverbank. They know. He's speaking, of course, about the Seminoles. Mitch peered nervously into the palm brush. Ellis crutched down by the water's edge. Sure is beautiful here, isn't it, Mitch? No wonder the Seminoles cling to their land. Have you been here long, Mitch asked? Have you seen much fighting? I arrived about a month ago aboard the steamship Santee. We came up through Biscayne Bay, ran aground and had to be towed and again, round again at the river's mouth. As soon as I set foot on shore, I was called upon to assist Lieutenant Mackle. He had been wounded by buckshot during a Seminole skirmish. I still recall the palmetto branches red with blood. There's danger here, son, all around. Stay clear of the old picket. Safety is best found at the fort. Still carries Lauderdale's name. Let me walk you down there. He motioned along the shore. Fort Lauderdale, Mitch asked. Sure, Fort Lauderdale, named for William, Major William Lauderdale, but the Major wasn't here very long. A short time after he got here, he became gravely ill. He never made it home to Tennessee. He died of lung ailments in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The drinking water made him sick. It's contaminated. Water comes up from the well. It just isn't fit to drink. Ellis looked off into the distance. Then there's the fever, he said sadly. Sick as dogs, many of the men. As doctor, I give them ep epipac root to make them throw it up and out of their systems. It's this weather, hot and sticky, mosquitoes thicker than this woolen uniform. Bet we'll lose nearly half our men to disease. We'll lose horses too. Since we don't often have the chance for a proper bath, I use a tonic of red pepper and vinegar to fight off disease. Mitch rubbed his nose. That explains the funny smell, he thought to himself. Come on, Mitch, let me get to you to shelter. I'll send a party to find your folks. Ellis placed his hand on Mitchell's shoulder. Must warn you, we're very low on provisions. The steamship Alabama is due with supplies, but she knows no schedule. Could be days before we see any signs of her. At this point, we're clean out of butter. The bacon is spoiled. Everything's gone, even the sugar. Nothing left but pork and bread. Oh, what will claim us in this paradise? Will it be the heat, the mosquitoes, the lack of water, spoiled food, or Seminoles? Mitchell, come away from there. You're too close to the water's edge. Come along, Aunt Helen scolded as she tugged on his shirt. The water taxi's back. It's time to board. Mitch looked around him. The cypress trunk he was leaning on was now a light pole. Where's Ellis, he asked. He was right here. Where did he go? Ellis, Aunt Helen asked. Who, who's Ellis? Ellis Hughes, the soldier from the fort, Mitch explained as he peered back at the river. A soldier, dear? I didn't see anyone. Maybe it was a security guard or something. Well, never mind that. We have to get going. Captain Carl is about to leave without us, and you're the reason we're here to start with. And Helen followed close behind. Where were you? Mitch's mother asked. We, we asked Billy, but he said you wandered off. Really, Mitch, you're 10 years old now. I'd hoped you might learn a little something on this trip, but as usual, you're off in another world. She turned to Pop-Up with a sigh. Dad, do you boys ever grow up? Not if I can help it, he chuckled with a wink. Hey, Mitch, he knelt down so Mitch and he could talk in private. Have you seen anything interesting through the binoculars? Have I? Have I ever? Mitch whispered to Papa. Mitch, come on, Captain Carl is waiting, Aunt Helen called. Come on, boys, we're going to lunch near the beach. You know, I don't get to see the ocean in Pennsylvania. She placed her straw hat on top of her silvery hair and tied it with a long yellow ribbon underneath her chin. Let's go. I'm ready, she shouted above the roar of the engine. Captain Carl turned the boat away from the dock and pointed the bow toward the river. The green canopy flapped in the strong wind. Mitchell's mother and Aunt Helen turned their faces up at an angle to catch the sun as they talked, but Mitchell couldn't hear what they were saying. 
Mitch, are, are you getting seasick? Billy asked. You look like you're sick or something. That's not good to be sick on your birthday. And you're so quiet. You didn't even want to see that big tarpon at the dock. No, no, Billy, I'm fine. I'm not sick. I'm fine. Pop up chimed in. He may be having too much fun today. Maybe there's too much to see and he can't take it all in. Is that true, Mitch? Before Mitch could answer, Captain Carl turned toward him. Hey, boy, see any alligators? He motioned out at the passing water. A long time ago, alligator hunting was big business here. The hides were salt cured and shipped in barrels to Savannah, Georgia, where they could be prepared and sent overseas. The people in Europe made belts and shoes and all sorts of stuff from our alligators. In the spring and summer, they hunted alligator here, but in the fall, they hunted otters. A good otter pelt was worth more than an alligator skin. You don't see many alligators or otters these days. <laughs> now it's jet skis and yachts. The yellow water taxi cut through the small waves as they made their way east. Look up ahead. That's Bahia Mar Resort. The city owns that land. It was a Coast Guard station from 1915 to World War II, but I think it was abandoned a few years after that. The marina opened in 1949, the very first marina in the city. I'm a little rusty on Spanish, Captain Carl, Aunt Helen stated. What does Bahia Mar mean? Well, Bahia is bay and Mar is sea, so it's the bay by the sea. The waterway we were in, which once called the New River Sound, sort of like a bay, it separated the beach from the mainland. Anyway, there's an interesting little piece of history here that very few people know about. Back in 1927, a Coast Guard cutter was sent to investigate some illegal activity in the Bahamas. You know where the Bahamas are, they're just off our coast. They stopped a smuggling boat operated by a Mr. Horace Alderman. Alderman resisted the officers and fired his gun, killing three men. For his crimes, Alderman was taken to the Coast Guard station that is now Bahia Mar. And on August 17th, 1928, he was hanged. He was the only person to be legally executed in Broward County by hanging. Oh dear, Mitch's mother sighed. That's not a very pleasant story to hear before lunch. She fanned her face with her straw hat. That's so cool, Billy yelped. It's like a pirate story like Blackbeard in North Carolina. They hanged pirates. <laughs> Could we change the subject, please, Mitch's mother begged. The bow of the water taxi pushed against the dock at Bahiamar. Captain Carl, would you like to come back for us in about two hours? I think that'll give us time for lunch and some sightseeing as well. Sure thing. Look for me right here. Enjoy yourselves. Everyone clambered on the dock and Captain Carl steered his craft back down the new river to get more passengers. What should we do first, Aunt Helen offered. Would you like to have lunch now or do a little exploring first? She winked her crystal blue eyes at Mitch. After all, this is Mitchell's special day. Let's hear what he has to say. Well, I'd like to see the ocean. What do you say, Billy? Ocean first, then lunch? Fine with me, Billy answered, and the five of them made their way to the overpass that led to the beach. Hey, Mitch, aren't those binoculars getting kind of heavy? Why not let Pop-Up carry them in his bag for a while? I mean, if we're going to explore, they might get in the way. <laughs> no way, Mitch replied as he held the dry leather case in his hands. Oh, I had to look for it. Here it is. I just might need these, but you wouldn't understand, Billy. What don't I understand? They're binoculars. I have a pair. I take them to ball games. Big deal. Oh, brother, turning 10 has really gone to your head. The sea breeze from the Atlantic was strongly scented with salt and brine. Pop-Up led the way from the overpass to the golden sand. What a glorious sight, Aunt Helen exclaimed as she looked around her. The wind blew through her hair and ruffled her cotton dress. There's nothing like this at home in Pennsylvania, she said. It's truly wonderful. She leaned over to Mitch. You are so lucky to have this all around you. She pinched his cheek. Pop-Up and Aunt Helen sat on a wooden picnic table while Mother, Mitch's mother looked for shells. If you find some dazzling ones, Helen, give them to me and I'll put them in my kitchen window back at home, Aunt Helen chuckled. Billy and Mitchell headed for the surf. Now boys, you must not get too wet. Remember lunch later. Billy headed a few steps down the beach where sandpipers were pecking in the water. Mitch looked out to the horizon where a cruise ship was making its way to Port Everglades. He held the binoculars to his eyes to see the name on the ship. I can't quite make it out, he said to himself. He looked again and focused the lens. There's a little focusing wheel right here. You turn this and it helps focus the binoculars. Nope, too far away to read that. Slowly, he turned to the north and followed the shoreline up the coast. There were kite flyers and sunbathers and a volleyball game, but the images started to grow fuzzy. Uh-oh, here we go again, he thought. 
Through the binoculars, sections of the beach became filled with plants and vegetation. People and buildings all faded away into green underbrush and tall pines. Here we go, he said as he scanned the shore. What the, what's that down the beach? Mitch wondered as a gray weathered building came into focus. Well, hello, where'd you come from? Asked a tall, thin man who walked up behind Mitch. You from a ship, son? Uh, no, well, sort of, I guess, a small boat. We just got here. We, who's we? Did you wreck on a shoal? Where'd you come ashore? Well, my mother and aunt and grandfather and a friend. I mean, we just came in from, he wasn't sure where they had come in from. The area looked so different, he lost his bearings. You're welcome here, name's Ed Bradley. Edwin R. Bradley, and I'm the keeper at the House of Refuge up the beach. House number four. Son, let's find your folks and get them to shelter. The elements will get to them before too long, but you don't look any worse for wear. Edwin began to walk along the shore using a piece of driftwood as a walking stick. I'll warn you, we're not doing it all well these days. It's hard here. We ain't got no water in the cistern, haven't had any for quite a spell. The family and me have only been here a few months since the turn of 1883. Wait, we weren't Sorry, it weren't till May that we got any rain. Then the blasted cistern wouldn't hold a drop. All the water leaked out and it got tainted from the cypress shingles on the roof. Living off coconut milk most days, pray for a miracle. How can I help shipwreck sailors like you if I don't even have enough to feed my family? He kicked the sand in frustration. You say there's five of you? Hmm, well, there's the sleeping loft. That is, if you can sleep. We ain't got no glass in the windows. The mosquito netting's torn. You, you could close the shutters to keep out the insects, but then you'd get no breeze. He picked up the pace as he walked, jabbing the stick into the soft sand. A strong breeze raced in from the Atlantic and tousled his wavy hair. How old are you, son? I'm 10, Mitch answered proudly. 10, it's my birthday. He followed Mr. Bradley along the shoreline. 10, ah, uh, yes. My dear Flora was just 10 when the angels came to take her. Not sure what ailment claimed her exactly. Wasn't the fever, just up and gone one day. Wife took it terrible hard, terrible hard. It's a difficult life out here, Mitch. There's times we don't even have enough food to sustain us. Mitch, we eat grits and grunts and palmetto cabbage for days. Don't know how we survive. Don't know how we're even gonna make it through the summer. He stopped and looked out at sea. But they need us here, they do, them who make their home on the sea. Mitch peered off to the horizon. Mr. Bradley, do you run a hotel for sailors? Hotel? Not quite, Mr. Bradley laughed weakly. Not a hotel, son, a shelter, a house of refuge for shipwrecked sailors. You see, if a crew runs a reef here, they're in trouble, the lot of them. No food, no fresh water without us giving it to them. Back 10 years ago in the October of 1873, a brig wrecked a bit south of here. Her hull went to pieces on a shoal, but the crew made it to shore safely. More's the pity. Those men had no food and no water. They ate dead fish that washed ashore. Most of the crew died of starvation and dehydration. He looked at Mitch in dismay. So they need us someone here. There are, there are five of these houses spaced 25 ap miles apart, all down the coast. We give them food, fresh water, and a bed, if we have it. Not much more, but at least it keeps them alive until a passing ship can take them on. Now then, where are your people? Let's show them the way. We can cook up some turtle eggs. I found a nest at my beach this morning. Ever had them? Small they are. Takes a whole dozen to make a batch of pancakes. As he spoke, Mitch slid his foot back and forth through the sand. Suddenly his shoe struck something hard. What's this? He asked as he dug out a small rusted ball. It looks old. He held the ball out to Mr. Bradley. Oh, you found another one. He laughed. I had lots of those. It's a musket ball from the war, the Seminole War. Oh, I still find all sorts of stuff from that war out here. Pieces of pottery, flint, buckshot. You know, the old fort stood right about here. You can still see the remains. Here, Mitch questioned? I thought the fort was on the New River. He remembered meeting Ellis Hughes. Yes, I'm sure the fort was at the river bend. Could be so, Mr. Bradley agreed as he nodded. There were three forts during that Civil War, but one stood right here, the last one. It was still called Fort Lauderdale, even though Major Lauderdale didn't live long enough to see it. It was built in 1839 and used through 1842. Funny thing, the House of Refuge was supposed to be built right here instead of where it is north up the beach. But as they unloaded board lumber back in 1876, the currents carried the ship north. Mr. Bradley motioned with a sweep of his arm. So it was built where the lumber was unloaded on Cunningham 
family land. I'm going to stop a minute. We're going to see a little drawing of Mitchell looking out at sea, standing on the beach. Washington Jenkins was the first keeper of the House of Refuge. I wonder if he knew it was built in the wrong place. Mr. Bradley looked down at the sand. You know, when I first came, Wash's family was still here along with his housekeeper, Miss Knight. But poor Wash, he became too sick to move, afflicted with illness, swelled up as big as a barrel, same illnesses that came claimed my flora. He was taken by boat down to Biscayne Bay. The old wooden sloop he built sat here next to my boat for months. He named it Rena Jenkins in honor of his daughter. Mitch listened as he looked through the binoculars again. Hoping to see the house of refuge for himself up the coast, it came into view, a simple structure on the beach. Mitch tried to focus the binoculars to get a look, better look, but the image grew fuzzier. Those binoculars. Let's stop for a minute and look. This is a picture of the house of refuge. It's not a, a very good picture. There are very few pictures of the house of refuge, but uh, this is where uh, shipwrecked sailors were brought ashore because there was no place for them to go. And if they couldn't uh, be picked up by another ship, they likely died. Uh, from having nothing to eat and no fresh water to drink, and perhaps even being attacked by uh, Seminole Indians who were still uh, upset about the Seminole Indian War. Let's see. Up the coast, he saw the House of Refuge, and the image grew fuzzier through the binoculars. Uh-oh, now what, Mitch wondered as he scanned the shoreline. He spied a tall man walking along the water's edge with a large sack. The man came nearer and nearer until he reached the spot where Mitchell stood. Morning, lad. Fair morning it is. Are you here to gather the settlement's mail? He reached into a large leather satchel and brought out a few envelopes bound together with brown string. They were postmarked 1887. Here, that's all for this round. Mitch looked down at his feet. The man wasn't wearing any shoes. Ah, you notice I wear no shoes. No shoes for me. I walk barefoot. See, it's easier to walk at the water's edge where the surf comes in. The sand is packed firmer. Easier to walk on, so... No shoes, just my bare feet. He wiggled his toes in the bubbling water and laughed. Say, I don't think we've met, he said, as he held out his hand to shake hands with Mitchell. I'm Mitchell Andrews. I'm here visiting with my family, Mitch said, as he began to worry about his mother and pop up and Helen and Billy. I wonder where they've gone, he thought to himself. And they sent you across the New River Sound to get the mail. Well, Mitch, I'm Ed Hamilton and I run the mail route on this coast. I walk from Palm Beach to Miami, 68 miles. Well, I don't walk all 68, I sail some of it. So I walk maybe 40, truth be told, a little sailing, a little rowing, a lot of walking. Some folks call me the barefoot mailman. He smiled as he dug his feet down into the wet sand. I usually spend the night at the House of Refuge before I row across the mouth of the New River and head for Lemon City. You stay here with Mr. Bradley's family, Mitch asked as he turned in Mr. Bradley's direction. Mr. Bradley was gone. Bradley? Oh no, son, he's been gone a long time now. Why, it's been years. He left not long after he lost his daughter to illness. No, son, Charlie's the keeper of the house now. Charlie Coleman, he came after Bradley left. Well, Mitch, my boy, I'm gonna go claim my bed for the night. Ed threw his knapsack over his shoulder and walked toward the building. In the morning, you can walk with me if you like. I charge $5 to travel this route. You wanna come along? Mitch looked around in bewilderment. Mitchell, Billy, and Helen called. Time for lunch, boys. Billy came running along the edge of the water. Come on, Mitch, let's get going. I'm starving. Mitch turned his head one way and then the other. He heard radio playing music nearby and several people were sunning themselves on bright blankets spread out on the warm sand. A small plane soared overhead towing a banner that advertised suntan lotion. Mitch, aren't you hungry? Let's go, Billy exclaimed. Mitch rubbed his eyes and looked down at the binoculars. The house of refuge was gone. No, you go on, he said. What, Billy asked? Go on without you. No, no, I was talking to Mr. Hamilton. He asked if I wanted to walk the mail route, and I... He looked around again, and I... Oh, never mind. Who's Mr. Hamilton? What mail? Billy screwed up his face at Mitch. Boy, you are really acting weird today. Mitch and Billy followed the others to the rooftop pool where everyone had a hamburger and a soda. Everyone, that is, but Helen, she insisted on seafood and was having a great time peeling the juicy pink shrimp piled high on her plate. Her drink was a, in a fancy glass with a miniature umbrella stuck in it. 
Soon, though, it was time for everyone to make the trip back home. I think she's on her way. I think I see her, Pop-Up said as he looked down the river. Let's get to the dock. Already, Aunt Helen asked. Boy, that time went fast. She folded her tiny umbrella and put it in her purse as a souvenir. Everyone stood at the water's edge to see Captain Carl. Mitch peered through the binoculars for a better look. Yep, I see him, he shouted as he pointed down the river. There he is. The bright yellow boat was making its way toward Bahia Mar. Yep, it's him. Captain Carl waved from the helm. Mitch waved back as he continued to look through the binoculars. Uh-oh, he said to himself as the image began to blur. Slowly, the yellow water taxi faded from view and a small wooden skiff took its place. A dark-haired man with a loosely fitting shirt was aboard, steering the boat with a long tiller attached to a rudder. The boat made a loud popping sound as it approached. Mitchell turned to Billy. Do you see that? He asked, but Billy and the others weren't there. Nor were the docks, nor the big yachts at the marina. Thick palmetto scrub was all around him, and his shoes were stuck in muddy soil as the river lapped them up. The wooden boat beached, and the man climbed ashore and gave Mitch an odd look. Let's see, who might you be, he asked, with a tilt of his head. He took his canvas hat and tossed it into the seat of his boat. The engine was still popping loudly. Has your paw come to work on the railroad? Did you arrive by steamship? Mitch had to speak up above the engine. I'm Mitch. I was, I was here having lunch. Lunch? Here? The man laughed as he tied up the boat. The sand fleas will have you for lunch. He winked at Mitch as he dusted off his shirt. I'm Ed King. I have a boy near your age. Bird's his name. He and the other children are back home, though. He smiled a toothy grin at Mitch. They'll be happy to have another young one around when they get to the settlement. Mitch looked a bit confused. I thought you said they were at home. Sure, they're at home. Home with the missus up in New Samirna at the farm. They're coming, though. Coming as soon as the train tracks get laid. I came ahead of them to get us secure. You know, this ain't no place for a family. Well, not yet. I see it's a fine spot, though. Never a freeze. Good weather. Twas the freeze that caused me to lose my citrus crop back in New Samirna. My crops froze last year, so I came here to find work. Yes, sir, 1895 was a bad year for many of us farmers up the state. We lost everything. Everything. Had to start anew. Ed held out his hand to block the sun over his forehead. Look down by the water. Why, you could snatch a fish by hand. There's so many. God love fishing. Do you like fishing, Mitch? Sure, Mitch replied. Billy and I fish the river every chance we get. Billy, is he a boy near your age? Good then, with my four children and the two of you, why, we'll get ourselves a school, a right fine schoolhouse. When Mr. Flagler comes, we'll have all we need. When's the train coming, Mr. King? Mitch questioned, trying to ignore the mention of school. He remembered seeing the train bridge over the New River where the water taxi had dropped them off earlier. Are the tracks downtown? Well, I don't know if you can call it a town yet, Mr. King laughed. Ain't nothing here. Nothing, you could see that, but you wait. Just wait till this, till the train comes. Why, this town will grow up right around those tracks, he paused. Why, the first passenger train is due to arrive in 1896, and folks will see what a fine place this is. Yes, sir, young Mitchell. You'll see this town spring up once the East Coast, the Florida East Coast Railroad gets going. My wife and children are coming by rail to their new home in this settlement, a brand new life. Mr. King scanned the western horizon from north to south. See all this mangrove? He asked as he pointed to the far shore. One day, mark my words, you'll see a town, a fine town. The train will change everything. Mr. King's hands were roughed and calloused and scarred. His pants were torn at the knee. I hope your folks are planning on staying a while, Mitch. He looked into Mitch's face. A person can get mighty lonely here. He wiped a sweating brow with the back of his hand. It gets very lonely here at times. Here's a picture of the train that came in 1896 to the New River Settlement. And do you know who that gentleman is in the other picture? Maybe you've heard the name Henry Flagler. Henry Flagler brought the train into Florida all the way down into the New River Settlement later into Miami and further down and eventually, eventually built a train that went all the way to Key West. It was an amazing story. We'll share that for another day. Mitchell, Mitchell, it's time to get in the boat. I know you had a wonderful, exciting day, but we have to get going. Mitch's mother was sitting on the front seat next to Aunt Helen, who was adjusting the brim of her hat. Billy was at the back staring in the water. Come on, Mitch, Pop-Up coaxed as he gave Mitch a little nudge. Come on, let's board. 
which stood at the edge of the seawall. In place of Mr. King's planked wooden skiff rumbled the bright yellow water taxi with Captain Carl at the wheel. Mitch looked over his shoulder, hoping to catch one last glimpse of Mr. King. All aboard, Mitch, Captain Carl hailed. Time to head back. Mitch held the binoculars tightly as he found his seat. The popping of Mr. King's boat rang in Mitchell's mind as he looked down the river. He recalled Mr. King's comments. One day, mark my words, you'll see a town. Yes, a fine town. Mitch smiled as the water taxi made its way back down the intercoastal. Well, Mitch, what do you say we put these away for now? Pop-Up gently took the binoculars from Mitch's lap and placed them into his canvas, canvas bag. I hope you got to use them. I hope they make, made your birthday special. He smiled gently and placed his arm around Mitch. After this trip, I'll bet you won't see the new river in the same way again. He gave Mitch a squeeze. My, what we learned today, Aunt Helen chimed in. There's so much history along this river. I sometimes think people just see Fort Lauderdale as a resort town, a place to go get away from the cold northern winters, but it's so much more than that. Why, I had no idea there were so many interesting stories here and so many interesting things to see. She removed her hat and placed it on her lap. The Stranahan House, the New River Inn, preserved for us to enjoy, she continued, like a window into the past. Mitch, don't you wish you could have been here for all the excitement as the city grew? But I guess that would have taken a little magic, wouldn't it? Helen laughed and winked at Papa. But Helen, there is magic on this river. Plenty of magic, if you know where to look, Pop-Up said. Yep, Mitch sighed, magic, plenty of magic. His mind raced with the people he had met on his travels along the river. I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the, uh, what happened to some of the people in our story. And because it's very interesting to know what happened afterwards. We talked earlier about the uh, Lewis Landing, Frankie Lewis's uh, place. There's a park there that you can visit, Lewis Landing on the New River. And um, we know a little bit about William Cooley and his attack at the, uh, at the Cooley Landing. And that's actually a marina now, very close to the Performing Arts Center uh, near the 4th, 7th Avenue Bridge, where that boat ramp is. It's not very far away from Will, where Will Cooley's family was uh, attacked. Um, we also know about the Gill Blast, the shipwreck that Will Cooley was going to salvage when the, his family was attacked. And they think they have found the Gill Blast very close to the Hillsborough Inlet. They've located some ballast stones and anchor chain and are pretty close that uh, pretty close to certainty that that's the wreck of the Gill Blast. Of course, wooden vessels uh, that sank that long ago, there isn't a whole lot left of them. We talk about the three forts in this book. Uh, there were indeed three forts. The first fort that William Lauderdale founded were the New River Forks. Uh, they weren't there very long because it was very difficult to get supplies to that fort. Even though we see the New River today as a very deep and uh, navigable uh, river, it wasn't at that time. It was a lot of swamp and it was very difficult to get a boat through. So uh, the men were not doing well there. Many of them died. Uh, so they moved the fort a bit east, uh, not too far away from Las Olas Boulevard. They weren't there very long and they finally moved the last and final fort uh, on the beach near where Behemar stands today, which is very close to uh, where uh, the House of Refuge was eventually moved. And we talked about the House of Refuge as a place that shipwrecked sailors could go, uh, otherwise they would perish on the sand from lack of supplies. The first House of Refuge was actually built uh, very close to where Bonnet House is on the land uh, that is now uh, Albert State Park, but right on the ocean side. There was no road there, of course. That uh, House of Refuge was later moved down to uh, the Bahiamar area. Uh, Ed King, we've talked about. Uh, Ed King was the one of the first builders here. He built many of the first uh, buildings of the city, built boats, and actually built coffins for when people didn't survive different uh, diseases and viruses or died of natural causes. Ed King was a very good friend of Frank Stranahan's and built the present day Stranahan house as we know it. Um, that house was built in 1901 and has gone through many transformations and is now a museum. Ed King uh, built that house for Mr. Stranahan. Ed King was later killed in the hurricane of 1928 that flooded the region of Lake Okeechobee and about 2,000 people lost their lives in that storm. So uh, we're going to close today by talking about Mitchell's Magical Day on the New River. I hope that you will continue to pursue 
uh, your interest in the river and the history of the New River. It's a very fascinating uh, story. Now, stay tuned uh, for programs ahead because we're going to talk a little bit about some things that occurred off our uh, beach. And our next book we're going to be reading is Mitchell's Magical Day on South Florida's Atlantic Coast. And this book talks about pirates and shipwrecks. And uh, I think you'll enjoy it. So we're going to be reading that one next. You stay tuned. It's good to see you today. Take care.